and Greg with Rommel Rights. Today we're going to take a look at the brand new Short Action Customs Nexus Press. Those of you that frequent the channel, you probably are already familiar with Short Action Customs. You've heard me talk about their fantastic reloading dies for quite a while now. The dies, whether it be the sizing dies or the bullet seating dies from Short Action Customs, have been my go-to dies for the last several years. Absolutely fantastic products. And Short Action Customs has a multitude of other product offerings, whether it be their barrel vices or their comparator sets. If you've never heard about Short Action Customs before, I would encourage you to go to their website and check them out because they are quite a fantastic company and they've been really easy to work with in a number of different areas. And they've proven over the course of several years that they are capable of producing a very high quality product and that they have both um, engineering capabilities and the repeatable fabrication techniques to deliver products that work time and time again. The number of products that I have used from Short Action Customs over the last several years has been quite large. And they continually have uh, shown me that they can, they can build this stuff and that they can hold their quality across a period of time and a large number of product offerings. So it's for these reasons that I was extraordinarily excited to check out their new press, the Nexus. Many of you that watch the channel have probably seen me loading on my favorite press, the Forster Coax. Now, while I do and have enjoyed that press for a very long time, there are deficiencies with it that I have run into over time. Uh, the way that it moves, um, the, the narrow little window that you have to work with uh, in getting cases in and out of it. It is very much a mass manufactured product where you're dealing with a a cast and then finished machined type process. It is proven to be a fantastic piece of my reloading equipment that I've come to rely on over the years. And the quick change die options for it, where I can just slide a die in there, slide it out and stick another one in its place. And that type of stuff has become critical to the way that I operate. All the different wildcatting that I do and cartridge testing that I do. The coax has been an absolutely wonderful piece of reloading equipment over the years. So when I looked at the new Nexus and saw that it had some similarities to how the dies particularly function, I was very excited about this thing. And then the hard resisted cam over that they've used to, to make this press uh, deliver consistent results also piqued my interest. So let's jump in and take a look at this thing. Now it's important to note that I have a pre-production model of this press. So this is literally one of the first that has ever been made and it has some of the associated dings and blemishes as a result. And so I haven't actually seen what the production models of this press are going to look like. It's very possible that there may be some small tweaks to the overall design and kind of look of things, but this is uh, pretty close to what the production units are going to be like. Just going over the feature set here from uh, top to bottom, we've got a, a dual-sided handle here with a rotating knob here. So you've got a very large handhold for grabbing a hold of this press. Very strong arms here. Um, I forget what material this thing is made out of, but it's made out of steel everywhere. So there's, to my knowledge, no aluminum parts on this thing. It's all a, a very heavy duty steel press that has been nitrided and treated exceptionally well. Now you may have seen this when I actuated the arm there the first time, but this uh, press has a little bit of a different feature set to it in the sense that the bottom uh, is not rising to meet the die. The die is actually what moves. So as we actuate the handle, it's the die itself that goes down the Attachment method up here is very similar um, to that from a Forster press. So we have the short action custom die here with their standard Forster lock ring. And it just slides right in like so. Now the die setup up here 
these are standard 7 8 14 dies, but the press is going to be able to do one inch dies. So a larger one inch die body will be accommodated in the future on this press. There is a series of screws in here that you can remove this kind of horseshoe shaped die retainer in the top. You can see right here the little ball detent that's in the side. There's another one over here on this side. And those ball detents are what retains your die. So when you snap the die in, it gets held in there by those little ball detents, but is not so tight that you can't easily pull the die out. Built into the top of the press, now this is, this is the part of the press that actually doesn't move. There is storage for your various shell holders. Down in the bottom of the press is where we find our shell holder. And uh, the way that this shell holder mechanism works is that you can kind of lock the shell holder in place with a couple of different methods. Now, the first one is, is you can just put these little spacers here that are replacements for your cam over spacers. So these spacers allow share the press to cam over. So like right there, we're actually hitting the cam over spacers. Now, if I continue pushing the handle down, you see the press cams over and locks in place and it's using these little cam over spacers to set that distance. These cam over spacers make contact with the underside of the ram and that's what gives us our cam over and they are replaceable. And so if we were doing an operation that required us to not have cam over and they kind of get stuck in there a little bit. Obviously they're under tremendous pressure when they're installed and they're kind of held in there by these little O-rings here that you can see. And so to get them out and, and swap them out with these spacers makes it so that you don't have any cam over. And these ones, obviously they do not have an O-ring at the, the bottom. And so you can see how they'll just slide in there really easily. So if you're doing this a lot, you'd probably just want to leave those O-rings out. And so now the press will not cam over. So you have a choice of whether you'd like to use cam over or doubt. You can choose. And the secondary function of these spacers, whether you're using the cam over ones or not, and if you store your spacers behind the shell holder, then the shell holder will run into them and it will not come out. However, if we remove those spacers, then our shell holder will just slide right out the back of the press. Now it's up to you whether you want to store these back here or not. Personally, I will just store them up on a bench somewhere. I'm not a hundred percent sure what the final solution for this uh, catching of your spent primers. I have a very elegant custom solution that I'm working on uh, to attach to the primer tube down here, but I just modified my Forster cup for the time being. And so the second method to retain the shell holder in there is to just use the primer tube. If you, if you screw the primer tube all the way up in here, it will lock that uh, shell holder in place so it, it won't allow it to move out. Now you can see that the shell holder is not in here rigidly. It moves about that far and so it's not um, stuck here in this orientation and then um, it, it does kind of move a little bit and, and fluctuates left to right front to back as well. So it is it has the ability to move around a little bit which I think that is good. I think that's a good idea. Um, the other thing to note is when we look at the shell holders themselves, they're not flat on the bottom. They actually have a, a bit of a cup to them. So this allows them to sit in this little cup 
and would allow for them to kind of self-center a little bit on here. And so it, it keeps them from being off axis to the base of the case. And uh, I, I think that's a very cool feature, um, keeping these cases straight during the sizing op is pretty critical to keeping things running correctly. And I'm going to reinstall my cam over spacers because I definitely do want them uh, installed and I do want them to cam over. Looking here for a moment at the attachment method, there's a provision for some socket head cap screws here. Um, you've got uh, two sets of them, two on the left, two on the right, and you can use whatever method to attach these things to your bench. I'm a big fan of using the inline fabrication flush QD ultra mount system. So I have this flush mount plate that is routed into my bench and I actually had inline fabrication make this mount custom for me. And it's a full thickness plate all the way down. They drilled and tapped the holes specifically for the short action customs nexus. And then they also put a hole in here for the primer drop tube. So I just drilled that extra hole here for the primer drop tube. And then I was able to get this thing flush with the front of my bench. And like I say, I have a more elegant solution for the primer drop tube so it doesn't stick out the front like that. Um, but the inline fabrication QD ultra mount system is what I would recommend for this. And they do have a pre-order available for the ultra mount plates that accommodate the Nexus already. Those plates, obviously, the, the Nexus will stick out the front of the bench just enough to clear this primer drop tube and they won't be flush like this. Now, if enough of you are interested in having a flush mount just like this, then get a hold of Inline Fabrication via email or give them a call and let them know that you'd be interested in having one of these. And they may decide to do a custom run of this exact style right here if they get enough interest. Look at how much space you've got here. That's a little over seven inches of space between the control arms. That makes getting brass in and out of this thing extremely easy. There is just a ton of room in here for your hands. And the case sits out towards you instead of way back in here, how you'd have on some presses. It's actually up here in the front where it's really easy to get to. Now the op rods themselves are not under any load. So th this little bushing here is what provides the lubrication for that movement of the, of the rail. And the press is mainly reliant on this very heavy-duty linkage here to provide its leverage and operation. So here's a very detailed look at what that linkage looks like in operation. So as we move the handle and cam over, you can see that our stops happen with this keyway here. So between this keyway and the actual bushings in the bottom here, um, that's how we know that we are getting positive cam over and we're getting the exact same distance every time. Because when we feel that keyway kind of slap into position there and the front of the arms are pulling forward on that, at the same time it's providing a perfectly linear connection back here, that tells us that we've got the maximum amount of pressure and we know that the bushings in the bottom of the press are giving us our exact dimension every single time. The addition of the rolling handle here is very nice because uh, one thing that I experienced very often with the Forrester Coax with the rigid top is that in a single day I would do hundreds, sometimes thousands of pulls of this handle and because it's static, I would, I would build up calluses and, I mean, it would really kind of tear on your hands after a while because when you're moving the handle, obviously your, the angle of your grip has to change. And so it would become a problem with heavy use on any of the 
the static handles where you're pulling down on the bench. And if the handle's rotating this way, well, that doesn't really do you much good. If the handle's rotating this way, well, then that keeps from having that kind of tearing motion on your skin. So this rolling handle is an extremely welcome feature on the Nexus. It is just extremely easy to use and very ergonomic. The first thing that you notice when working with the press is that it's so simple and easy to get in here. The workspace is just so open compared to other press designs. Uh, it's just really cool as far as that goes. The space is is ample where if you've got slightly bigger hands, you have no problem getting that case in there. And the shell holder, it will always be oriented toward the front. It doesn't just spin on you. So uh, it's not going to get out of whack by too far on the margin. And so getting the case in and out is extremely easy. Grabbing up here, it, it is such an intuitive thing to do. And it, I can say at this point by far, this is the most ergonomic of any press that I have run so far. And unlike other presses that have a somewhat ergonomic design, you don't feel like the press is somehow compromised in its ability to do its job to gain that ergonomics. You have a very much inline power configuration here where all of the forces that are getting applied are directly in line with the center of the die. So the ergonomics doesn't come at a cost to precision and accuracy. So that's extremely cool. And just using the press feels extremely natural. It you don't have to uh, sit off to the side of it. You can just kind of sit right in front of it. Now, I'm sitting basically with my right arm, the arm that I'm using to operate this thing, in line with it. So ergonomically, this thing is set up to give you the most trouble-free and ergonomic experience that I could envision. I don't know why you'd ever want to do this, but, I mean, there's enough room here where you can even get in there underhanded and run this press. And, again, I don't know why you would ever want to do this, but you theoretically can operate it underhanded instead of overhanded. The rigidity and robustness of this press really stands out to me. It... When you grab a hold of this thing and it's rigidly mounted to your bench, you really feel like you've got something in your hands here. I mean, this thing is just unbelievably rigid and stout. Now, keep in mind, folks, that I've only had this press for just a couple of weeks. I've only had a chance to load a few hundred rounds on this thing so far. The preliminary results that I'm seeing are extremely promising because... I'm not seeing any variants that I hadn't seen before in my ammunition, and this press is the only thing that I've changed in my process. I predominantly seat bullets on the amp press these days, the, the force measurement uh, with inline dies. So I'm usually using the uh, Short Action Customs Infinity die or custom Wilson-style inline dies to seat bullets. But I did seat a batch of 100 rounds on the short option customs press. It's a little too early to say that I've seen an improvement. I believe that I have, um, but I most certainly have not seen a reduction in performance. So the press is able to produce these results. When it comes to headspace, I think I've seen an improvement on headspace. Um, typically speaking, I'm able to hold, again, plus or minus about a half of a thousand really effectively on headspace. Most of the time, a little bit better than that. Here, I'm seeing a little bit better than that so far. Uh, the the results that I'm seeing are probably marginally better, folks. When we start getting into um, trying to d discern the difference between a half of a thousand, five or so, four or five, ten thousandths, that's something that's going to take me quite a long time to quantify because you can't draw conclusions on things that are that small with just a few hundred cycles through this thing. I really need to see how it's going to behave over time as conditions change, as the brass changes, as I treat the brass differently uh, in my various testing efforts. 
I'll get a better understanding at that point of just how close I can hold the tolerance. But as again, that's just my ceiling right now. Uh, and I can't necessarily quantify that with hard data, but I feel like this press is giving me a even better tolerance than I'm used to when it comes to headspace in particular. In bullet seating depth, I honestly believe that the bullets and the ogive and the seating stem that I'm using with the bullets and the seating force that's at play. I honestly don't think that I'm going to be able to see much of an improvement there on this style of press. I think in order to see the improvement there, you probably need to be using inline dies and a force measuring robotic insertion like the amp press for seating bullets. But doing it traditionally on this press, I, I can safely say that there's no reduction in performance that I've seen on bullet seating depth. But I do feel like there is some gains to be had on this press with where it comes to headspace. I feel like I'm getting better and more consistent headspace numbers when I'm sizing and bumping shoulders on this press than I have any other press that I've seen in the past. And now the best that I've seen to date has been on my Forster coax up until this point. Again, the benefit here is that I didn't change anything with the exception of this press. I'm using the exact same short action customs dies that I had, had been using this whole time. And I'm using that in the same cartridges, the same rifles, and I, I'm basically just switching the press here. One thing I can say for absolute certain folks is it's no worse. And the overall ergonomics and the feel of the press are significantly better than what I have felt in the past. I feel like it, I could size cases for like 10 hours straight on this thing. The ergonomics of it are so much better than what I've used in the past. And then the primer handling is just phenomenal. Um, I don't have to worry about some dainty little primer tube getting break off or um, the tube itself getting plugged with primers because it's not large enough in diameter. The primer handling aspect of this has been solved entirely compared to other designs. There's no primers going through a RAM and getting stuck and all of these dumb things that happen with, with primer handling. So decapping cases during the full length sizing op using a one piece expander decapper mandrel the way that I like to do with the short action customs dies or with Forrester dies, for instance, that is just brain dead simple in this press. It is set up from the inception. The design is there to accommodate that kind of behavior. So I'm really impressed by that aspect of it. And I do have some uh, kind of cool design about how I'm going to be doing the spent primer handling. Um, so be on the lookout for that in the future video. But in the meantime, I'm just using this modified cup. I had some extra cups around for the Forrester coax and so I just rammed a bigger hole in that thing and stick it over top of this uh, uh, tube on the on the Nexus here. My feelings about the Nexus press are pretty succinct right now and I just find it to be the most excellent press that I've ever used. So th I, this is now my primary reloading press and it is going to be bolted to that station and not move and so i'm going to be subjecting this thing to app just thousands and thousands of rounds over the next summer i'm in love with the thing it's just fantastic however it's brand new uh i'm going from a press that i have probably 150,000 or more rounds loaded on um probably more and i'm stepping into a brand new press that's really i would just have a few hundred cycles on so I'm really curious at this point to see how it holds up. Now, given my history with Short Action Customs and the components that they've used on this thing, the, the hardware, what they've made, the extremely robust materials that they've made this press out of, I don't really have a feeling that says it's going to wear out or something like that. But we never know, do we? When we get new gear, we, we won't really know what it's capable of until we actually use it. And that's exactly what I intend to do. I intend to put tens of thousands of cycles on this thing in as short a time period as I can and manage and share that experience with you guys. If you are interested in getting a Nexus for yourself, there is a pre-order going on on the Short Action Customs website. I would strongly encourage you head over there and get your order put in. If history is any teacher here, folks, these things are going to be on back order for a long time.
So if you want any chance of getting one of these things, you're probably going to have to go and just get in line and wait for yours to be produced. Typically speaking, when a product like this that is as profound and as epic as this press is, it, the demand almost always surpasses the available supply. And I think that we're going to see that with this press for a very long time. Frankly, I don't know that there's a manufacturing effort that could be undertaken to satisfy the demand on these presses. Once people get a chance to use them for themselves, they're going to realize just how amazing they are. They're going to want one. And that's going to persist for quite some time. And so I don't have any idea how many tens of thousands of these things they're going to sell. But if you want any chance of getting one in the near future, you're going to have to go and get your pre-order put in and get on a list. Um, I wouldn't expect to see these things available on a shelf somewhere for like years. I could be mistaken. <laughs> Maybe they will do something amazing from a, a production standpoint. Um, but these things are going to be in demand, folks. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Acts, and we're in Acts 27. And uh, I'll start the reading here in uh, in verse 21. But to give context, this is uh, Paul is being taken to uh, stand before Caesar in Rome. And obviously he had been persecuted while he had traveled around and and preached the gospel in in various cities. And um, here they were in... Um, various cities in in Crete, and so they had, essentially the Romans had gathered them up and were persecuting Paul, and they got to a point where they were, Paul was facing such persecution that he made an appeal to Caesar and said that these people are not fit to try me, and I want to plead my case in front of Caesar. And so Uh, After a lengthy, drawn-out trial process there locally, the Romans decided to send uh, Paul to Rome, and and by way of ship, they were going to go to um, Italy, and they were going to plead, Paul was going to plead his case to Caesar. So that's the context here. Paul had warned them that they should not travel by boat, they should wait. It was during the fall of the year, and the waters are generally very treacherous in the fall. And Paul had pleaded with them to wait until that season had passed, and they elected to press on instead, avoiding, uh, ignoring Paul's advice and ignoring the advice, obviously, that God had given Paul. Paul was in communication constantly with God via angels, and angels were coming to Paul and warning him and telling him about various things that were going on during this particular time period in Acts. Again, we'll read the verse here, Acts 27, verse 21. No one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, Men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss, but take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me, and he said, Don't be afraid, Paul. For you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. So there's Paul basically saying, hey, don't worry, everything's going to be fine, but we're going to be wrecking this ship and we're going to have to uh, abandon it and we're going to all end up on an island. And so imagine yourself being in that position. You're on this boat with this uh, prisoner, quote unquote, that you have this man of God that you're taking to plead his case before Caesar. And obviously everyone has hated Paul and other apostles and many Christians throughout history for stirring up trouble by spreading the truth of the gospel wherever they go. And so they're persecuted and under trial all the time for being righteous people. And it's very much that same way today. Wherever you go, you will find persecution. If you're a man of God, if you are pursuing faith vigorously, if you are trying to model your behaviors after what you see uh, in the example of Jesus, 
then you are undoubtedly going to come under fire. And this particular passage in Acts deals with how there Paul is being hauled off to trial via boat, and an angel comes to him and says, your ship's going down. Now imagine if an angel came to any of you uh, tonight and said, you're going to wake up tomorrow when you're going to be fired from your job, you're going to be arrested, and you're going to crash your vehicle, and all of these terrible events are going to take place, but that you're not to worry about it because you'll be fine. Well, folks, what I've just described is the reality of what many of you are facing today, what many of you will continue to face as you go through life. As followers of Christ, we are not guaranteed that we will never have anything bad happen to us, that we'll never have trials. But there's always a way, if we seek guidance from the Spirit, if we ask for the help of God, there will always be a way to find our way closer to Him. And it's that that we can draw from a lesson here from this, this passage in Acts, where despite the fact that they're going to be shipwrecked in the ocean, which I can't imagine a more <laughs> unpleasant and scary thing to have happen, but yet the strength of God and the protection of God will persist through those trials. So if you're going through anything at the moment, just understand that this shipwreck of yours will indeed be temporary as long as you stay close to God, as long as you stay vigilant in your faith, as long as you're willing to choose God as the most important thing, as long as you're willing to align yourself with Jesus first, then all these trials and these things that you're going through will not actually have as big of an impact on your life as you might think. There's not really a reason to worry about it. In point of fact, in Scripture, we're called and challenged to not worry about any of these worldly things, because at the end of the day, they just are not that important. What is important is that you maintain your relationship with God, and that you continue your pursuit of that ever closer relationship with Jesus, and understand none of this stuff really matters, folks. Who likes you, what you have, what you don't have, none of that stuff is actually really important. What you're going through right now, while it might seem traumatic and terrible, just understand that if you're being allowed, if it's being allowed to happen, and you're being allowed to go through it, chances are that you're supposed to go through it. You need to go through it. God's preparing you for something amazing that's coming that you don't yet know of. And in many cases, just like happens with Paul in his journey, you will have terrible things happen. But those terrible things, I mean, think of the unbelievable testimony that Paul was able to give after the shipwreck occurred. Because what Paul had told them was going to happen and they did not believe indeed did happen. And so what a testimony when we are trying to live good godly lives and we know that uh, we might be in the middle of something that seems outside of our control and maybe is outside of our control, but we live and act and speak in such a way that telegraphs our relationship with Jesus and our relationship with God and the Spirit to the world. And they will see that this trouble that we face does not define us. They will see that not only does this trouble not affect us in any way that it might affect them, they'll see that a good Christian person will handle adversity with vigor. You'll handle adversity with happiness and a continual seeking of God in all things. That testimony, watching you go through your tough thing, and seeing you stay close to God, seeing you not compromise on the Christian principles that define us as followers of Christ, that will be an everlasting testimony. And it doesn't really even matter how your situation turns out. The victory will be in People seeing you have gone through it in a way that brings nobility and honor to the name Christian.